open, if you would, to Romans. Romans chapter 11, we pick up in our study of the book of Romans, Romans chapter 11 and verse 11. When you find it, if you would stand in honor of God's word as I read our text, verses 11 to 24, Romans 11 and verse 11. The word of God says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? I'm speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishment, nourishing root of the olive tree, do not become arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And that is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Would you pray with me, Lord, help us to understand things which are perhaps beyond our abilities. Give us heaven's wisdom and the mind of Christ so that we can discern spiritual things, so that we can understand those things which have been freely given to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Well, do you ever read sections of scripture and just think, what? What are you talking about? (laughs) Do you ever read passages, especially in Romans chapter 11, and just think, what in the world is he talking about? Well, guess what? You're in good company. Turn, if you would, to the right. Go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, and perhaps a, a verse that you're familiar with, maybe one you've never really noticed before. 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 15, the apostle Peter is speaking. He is the author of of the book of second Peter, right? And this guy knew what he was talking about. He was an apostle. He was maybe the foremost of the original apostles before Paul himself was saved and became the missionary to the Gentiles. Peter was the missionary to the Jews. Peter not only was maybe best friends with Jesus, one of his closest apostles, he was also uh, an inspired writer of God's word. He wrote the books of first and second Peter. And look what he says in second Peter chapter three and verse 15. It says, count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. And Peter and Paul knew each other. They even had, according to Acts chapter 15, occasions to meet. Perhaps at times they even ate together. They they knew each other. And he says, Paul wrote these things to you in accordance with the wisdom given to him. Now look in verse 15. He does this in all of his letters when he speaks in these matters. There are some things in those letters of Paul that are hard to understand. Did you catch that? There were times when the apostle Peter and the apostle Paul got together. And as Paul is eloquently speaking of divine doctrines and really delving into the depth of the riches and wisdom of God, the apostle Peter looked across the lunch table and said, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. What are you talking about? The Apostle Peter would read Paul's letters and go, huh? What do you mean? There are some things we know, we go back now to Romans chapter 11, which are difficult to understand. We can look into the deep abyss of the theology of the scriptures and end with maybe more questions than answers. 
Remember, it was the Apostle Paul himself who just a few verses later in Romans chapter 11 and verse 33, what will be our text for next Sunday, concludes the entire section, Romans 11 and verse 33, with this statement, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable are his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to God that now he should be repaid? From him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Even after the apostle Paul got done writing Romans chapter 11, he just said, you know what? There are some things which not even I fully understand. And let me encourage you as we jump into Romans chapter 11, what is really the meat of the chapter this morning? That it is okay. It is okay to be an apostle Paul. It's okay to be educated, to be eloquent. It is okay to be curious. It is okay to want your deep theological questions satisfied. That is okay. But let me encourage you, it's also okay to be an apostle Peter. And just to say, you know what? Let's cut to the chase. I, I, I don't fully understand everything we're talking about. But you know what? I know that God is good. And I know when it all boils down, that what he's really saying in Romans chapter 11 is that people need the Lord. People need the Lord. That is the point of Romans chapter 11. And so as we talk about cultivating olive trees and breaking off branches and regrafting branches and all of that stuff, and don't be arrogant, you know, but fear God, his severity and his kindness. We're talking about all of these, what could be very deep theological discussions that don't forget the main point is that people need the Lord. And if you leave with that, you've left understanding Romans chapter 11. In the late 1930s, Jesse Owens was not only the greatest athlete in America, he was controversially so because he was black. 1936, Berlin, of all places, hosted the world's Olympic Games. In the 1930s, the German chancellor and his Nazi party were convinced that the Aryan Germans were superior in every way to any other nation on earth. Jesse Owens proved that wrong by winning four gold medals in a single Olympic Games. It had never been done before. He won them in the long jump, the 100 and 200 meter dashes, and then the four by 100 meter relay. Four gold medals standing at the top of that podium. Now, you've probably heard most of that before, but there's an interesting side note in history that is rarely discussed. While he was attending and competing in those Olympics, 1936, Jesse Owens made a friend of one of his competitors, a man named Luz Long. This would have been unremarkable, except that Luz Long was the competitor from Germany. The two spoke. They often encouraged each other. They continued, in fact, a friendship by mail for the next several years. Owens so appreciated the friendship and support that he received from Long that he at one point said, and I quote, it took a lot of courage for Luz Long to befriend me right in front of Hitler. <laughs> right? Look at the, they're, they're inside of the Olympic arena and there they are standing together. And he said, look, it took a lot of courage for him to do that. He said, you can melt down all of the medals I've won, all of the cups I have, and they wouldn't become a plating for the 24 karat friendship that I felt for Luz Long in that moment. As they continued to correspond through letters over the years, Luz Long communicated to his friend Jesse this statement. In one of his letters, he said, My biggest fear is not that I would die, but that I would die for the wrong thing. Now, can I ask you, what is your greatest fear? Do you have any phobias? Uh, maybe spiders or heights? fear of public speaking, maybe something more existential and permanent like death, that you have a fear of death. Does your fear of dying pale in comparison to your fear of dying for the wrong thing? Uh, maybe like lose long, devoting your life to something which does not matter. Succeeding maybe in something which will not last. We've said that the book of Romans is the greatest single book of all time. It communicates with soaring beauty and clarity the gospel of God as revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. 
Its pages contain not only that one must be saved, but how one is to be. The book can be broken into some major sections, which we've been studying for the last year or so. They are written on banners against the back wall of the sanctuary. It can be broken into several big sections, most of which we've studied. Chapters 1 to 3 describe the righteousness of God being revealed in the condemnation of mankind because of our sin. Chapter 1 describes the natural bent of man's heart toward depravity. We are bent toward sin, not toward holiness. We have universally demanded the freedom to rebel against God. We have made this demand of our Creator. We want the freedom to rebel, and He, in His grace, has given us that freedom. If He were not a gracious God, He just would have hit reset and killed us all. <laughs> But in his grace, he has said, okay, I will give you the freedom to rebel against me. And because of this, we all now face the judgment of God. In fact, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says it this way. It says, none is righteous, not even one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Not a single person on earth in history has ever been a righteous person other than Jesus Christ himself. Now, at the end of chapter 3, and then going through chapters 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul describes the righteousness of God revealed in justification. He declared that there is a way of being saved apart from the law, apart from our own righteousness. He said that we can be saved through the righteous works of Jesus Christ by faith. Romans chapter 3 and verse 21 said it this way, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And you may recall the Lord providing us with a guide in chapter 4 on our road to saving faith, that guide was Abraham himself, the man of faith. In chapter 5, the apostle described how Jesus Christ undid the consequences of Adam's sin by succeeding where Adam had failed. Chapters 6 and 7 then turned a corner. He began to describe the righteousness of God being revealed in sanctification as he used his own testimony as an example of being set free from the bondage of sin and made holy. He said there really is genuine freedom in Christ. And yet he said, you can be free in Christ and still struggle against the spiritual storm raging in your own heart. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, he says, we were buried therefore with Christ by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. But what has been given to us, granted to us, is not only salvation, forgiveness of sin, but the ability now to live holy lives. We can pursue righteousness, and through that righteousness, we can be given joy. <laughs> in chapter 8, you guys know my feelings about chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the greatest chapter in Romans. Romans is the greatest book in the Bible, and the Bible is the greatest book on earth. And so Romans chapter 8 is the greatest chapter and the greatest book and the greatest book ever written. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. No condemnation, church. If you are in Christ then you are not hanging on to the outside of Noah's ark, hoping not to fall off. You are inside of the ark and sealed by the grace of God, protected from his wrath, protected from his judgment, protected from condemnation. If you are in Christ, then this right now on this earth is as close to hell as you will ever be. This is it. You only have righteous freedom to look forward to. Chapters 9 to 11 describe the righteousness of God revealed in his restoration. And, and specifically, his restoring of his people, the Jews. Chapters 9 and 10 of Romans dealt with the Jewish rejection of their own Messiah. And then the Lord's subsequent rejection of them as God's primary ambassadors to the world. But we read in chapter 11 that as their rejection was not total... Right? We looked at that a few weeks ago at the beginning of Romans chapter 11. Indeed, the Apostle Paul was Jewish. Right, It's not that every single Jew is now outside of the grace of God. It was not total, but neither was it final. Chapter 11 describes a restoration of the Jews. 
at some point in the future. And our text this morning is a reminder to devote our lives to that which will last for eternity. It gives a warning to those who may be tempted to toy with their own souls, who might be tempted to play games with their faith, thinking that somehow, despite their ignorance and arrogance, the Lord would certainly never put me out. But the partial and temporal rejection of the Jews by God tells another story. It actually says that there were some of those branches broken off because of their disbelief. But our text this morning also contains the promise that that rejection by God has, had as its purpose the inclusion of the Gentiles into his divine grace. And in a stroke of irony, I believe, which only the Lord could devise, the Gentile inclusion made available because of the Jewish rejection is the very thing which God will now use as the means of a future conversion of the Jews. Let me tell you what I just said. The Jews reject their Messiah, Jesus. Because of their rejection of Jesus, the Lord then rejects them by breaking off some of their branches, the disbelieving branches. He used that rejection of the Jews then to open the door of salvation to the Gentiles. Now raise your hand if you're a Gentile. Right Here we all are. We live now in a mostly, predominantly Gentile church. His rejection of the Jews meant salvation for the Gentiles. The stroke of irony here, and, and again, what I believe could only be devised by the divine mind, is he is going to now use the inclusion of the Gentiles in order to make those Jews jealous, in order to bring them back to faith. We are saved because of their rejection, and they will now be saved because of our inclusion. Does that make sense? Then you've got Romans 11. There it is. You got it. The whole point is God working out this, this heavenly, eternal orchestra, all playing these notes and bringing harmony to one another so that people will understand this great statement. That in the end, what people actually need and what will be the answer to all of their personal problems and all of the world's problems is that people need the Lord. You pay particular attention to the wording of verse 11. Did they stumble in order that they might fall? He says, by no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Jews. There it is. So as to make Israel jealous. Uh, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Two questions I think should be asked regarding the nature of that stumbling. First, was it the design of God in permitting the stumbling of the Jews, that they should ultimately become miserable and perish. In other words, will the nation of Israel be finally and fully cast from the kingdom of God? Fine, he says. Then Israel is out forever. He says, by no means. No. He says that stumbling is temporary. That's the first question. Second question is this. What was the purpose of God then? in allowing the Jews to stumble. And again, a clear answer, I think. The answer is to usher in salvation to the Gentiles. And as has always been the, 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 the case throughout chapters 9 and 10, and even uh, always been the plan of God that the gospel would go out into all the world. It has always, from the Old Testament through the New Testament, been the plan of God that all peoples would be saved. Even the calling of the Jews and the covenant to Abraham, so was that so all the nations would be blessed. In the prediction of the coming Messiah, Isaiah the prophet, 700 years before that Messiah would be born, said that a light to the Gentiles would come in. At the birth of that Christ, the Messiah, the angelic choir proclaimed glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men. God genuinely does want what is best for his kids, just like you and I want what is best for our kids. Randall and Samantha want what is best for six-day-old baby Piper, right? They want what is best for her. God is willing to do the things for them which are in their best interest, even when his kids may not agree, just like you and I would. There are going to be some systems, some rules, some boundaries that Randall and Samantha as new parents will put on their six-day-old baby girl, and she will not like all of them. Isn't that true? But we as parents are willing to say, you know what? I know that you don't agree with everything I'm doing, but guess what? 
It's for your good. And I know that you can't see it yet, but someday you'll look back and you'll thank me for making you eat your broccoli. And guess what? When you have your own kids, guess what you're going to make them do? You're going to make them eat their broccoli. You're going to make them. They, you have to. You just have to. Why? Because my parents made me eat it. Your parents are going to make you. Right? This is what we do. We know what is best for them. And so we are going to make sure that their lives, that our lives are giving them the orientation that they need to make their lives good. Our Heavenly Father, in the same way out of His genuine love and concern for His own kids, orchestrates their lives in such a way that they would see His love, that they would see His compassion, and ultimately worship Him. That's what, they, that's what He wants. And this, it turns out, is exactly what He wants for the nation of Israel. Why, after they turn their back on Him, does He then turn their back, His back on them? The answer is so that they would come back. Now consider now the difference between that word stumble and the word fall. What's the difference between stumbling and falling? The implication seems clearly to be that although Israel tripped, they did not do so irrevocably. It says in verse 11 right at the end, so as to make Israel jealous. The purpose of the rejection of the Jews was the salvation of the Gentiles. But the purpose of the salvation of the Gentiles is the restoration of the Jews. Only the divine mind could have conjured such a beautiful and ironic plan. Pick up in verse 12. It says, Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion or fullness, how much more will their fullness mean? Now, the general meaning of this verse is obvious. If by the Jews' rejection the Lord has provided spiritual riches to the world, Imagine the abundance of riches that the Lord will bestow if those same people repent and are restored. The apostles' clear goal is to state that the full restoration of the Jewish people is a de desirable event. I, I think this verse can be interpreted one of two ways. Either Paul is indicating that the full inclusion of the Jews will spark a salvation event perhaps unparalleled in human history. Uh, those who hold to this view believe that a little bit later in verse 26, when he says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved, that that is referring to a national salvific event where every Jew on earth will be saved. There are many who believe that way. They would even point to the book of Revelation referencing a salvation of 144,000 Jews. You've heard that number before. They would say, well, that is the full inclusion of the Jews. He's talking about bringing them all into Christ. It could mean that. It could also mean that the Jewish people who have believed in Christ for salvation and are therefore considered full Jews, fullness of the Jews, will bring an even greater blessing on the Gentiles. It would be like saying, if those who have rejected Christ have bought riches on the world, how much more will those who have believed in Christ bring riches on the world? Now, this interpretation, I think, makes sense. If you understand verse 26 to be referring to the fullness of the Gentiles as being the salvation of spiritual Israel rather than ethnic Israel. I think this interpretation, I think, also fits nicely with Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, which states that there is no longer any separation between Jew and Gentile. All are one in the church. Uh, and I'm going to read that text for just a moment and just marinate in the beauty of these promises as I read. Ephesians chapter 2 says, remember that you were at, that, at one time, at that time, separated from Christ. He's referring to Gentiles, everybody who just rose their hand. You were separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Do you guys remember what it was like before Christ in your life? Is that not an apt description? <laughs> alienated, strangers, without hope, without God in the world. I was just going through my life, bouncing around like a pinball. But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man, that is the church, 
in place of the two, that is Jew and Gentile, and so making peace. What God has done in Christ is broken down the divide between Jew and Gentile. There are no longer now two men. There is one man in Christ. He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility between the two men. Is he speaking literally? That literally there will be a national revival of the Jews? Is he speaking more figuratively? That this is referring to a spiritual Israel and that their inclusion as believers will bring blessing on the world? Honestly, it doesn't particularly matter. And godly men and women pray and study and author books on both sides of that issue. What does matter is the gospel message that we preach and that we believe. We need to give people what they need. And what do people need? 1987, Billy Graham came to Denver. I know that is true. I have seen pictures of it. And I know that some of you were there. Right, Liz, were you there? You were there, Billy Graham Crusade at Mile High Stadium in uh, 1987. During that Billy Graham Crusade, a man named Steve Green stood up and began to sing. And he, he sang a song that became very famous. It became a solo song in almost every church at some point in the 1980s and 90s. At some point, somebody in your church stood up during the offertory or something and sang these words. Every day they pass me by, I can see it in their eyes. Empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pain, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. And then he breaks into a chorus. People need the Lord. You guys remember that song? People need the Lord, right? People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams, he's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? And could it be, church, that there will be a massive national repentance among the Jews at the end of days? Yes, it could be. We've got to insist that their salvation would be based on their individual faith in Jesus Christ, not necessarily on their ethnicity alone. Otherwise, Romans chapter 4, 9, and 10 are all completely worthless. The point of all of it is that people need the Lord. The author elaborates on that idea verses 13 to 16, and then starting in 17 to the end, he gives this warning about becoming arrogant in your faith. Notice verse 13 says, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Paul here is saying that his ministry goal was to bring as many Gentiles as possible into the kingdom, and by magnifying his ministry, he's saying that he was committed to the faithful discharge of his duties. And let me ask you, church, are you? Are you committed to the faithful discharge of your duties? What has the Lord called you to? Are you committed to faithfully discharge your ministry as a spouse, as a parent, as an employee, as a servant of the church, as a neighbor? I would encourage you to have that same commitment. I magnify my ministry, the Apostle Paul says. He continues, verse 14, in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from death? The future restoration and conversion of the Jews will indeed be a glorious event, one which is perhaps unparalleled in human history. One commentator has described that day as glorious for the whole world, a joyful and desirable event as though a new world had arisen. And his statement, the reconciliation of the world in verse 14 refers to a great conversion of men and women in the presence of true religion, not a fake faith. And his statement then bringing death or from death to life as a spiritual figure of speech makes sense. It most certainly does mean this. Anytime large portions of a population are converted, there follows a time of great blessing. Life will be given after death. You think of the great reformations and awakenings in our own country's history. The first great awakening of the mid-1700s, sparked by the preaching ministries of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. The second great, great awakening, a hundred years later, 
Pastors like Charles Finney and others sparked the anti-slavery movement, the Underground Railroad, women's rights, the Salvation Army, the YMCA. All of these things were done because of the preaching of God's Word, a second great awakening. The third great awakening, shortly after that, fueled by the ministry of Dwight L. Moody, (laughs) with an emphasis on getting right with the Lord because of the eminence of Christ's coming. My former church, where I often used to preach, there was an elderly woman, Indian, by ethnicity named Mercy Rajaratnam was her name. First generation Indian, migrated here as a young girl, had a very thick Indian accent. She outaged me by about 60 years. She would come to me after I would preach, and she would always give me, because she knew I liked Indian food, I still do. She would bring me, she would cook for me chicken curry or chicken tikka masala or one of those things that I liked, along with rice. She would bring it in a Tupperware. She would hand it to me at the end of my sermons, and she would say, I made it extra spicy. (laughs) She said, just like your preaching. (laughs) And then she would say... Then she would say, you remind me of D.L. Moody. And I thought, did you know him? <laughs> like, are you old enough that you knew D.L. Moody? I don't think she actually did. There's no way she could have even overlapped with his life. But nevertheless, his spicy preaching sparked a great awakening in American history. And 50 years after that, another one, the Azusa Street Revival the birth of the Pentecostal movement, which really emphasized holy living. The 1960s, 70s, 80s, another revival sparked by Billy Graham himself, culminating in the one-way movement. All of these revivals were a blessing to those people whose lives were transformed by the gospel, and we would pray for that kind of revival today. Amen? Is it not our prayer, Lord Jesus, save our nation bring life where there is death that's what he's talking about when people become saved he says it is like life is breathed into them that they are now alive where they were spiritually dead i was speaking to my very good friend pastor brad hayen who many of you know he leads our trips to israel i was speaking to him this week about life and death about our longing for heaven and honestly the longer i live on this earth the more I long for the life to come. Amen? That resonates more with this service than at the 11 o'clock service, where the average age here is slightly older. Isn't it true? The longer we live on this earth, the more we don't want to live on this earth anymore. You can cling to life if you want. but The longer I live here, the more I want to be there. I can't wait. I will wait. But I can't wait to throw off the shackles of flesh and sin and temptation and weakness and to clothe myself with the white robes that Jesus has procured for me and to take hold of the crown of righteousness which awaits. What a day that will be. And if all this text refers to is a spiritual revival, then what a glorious day we have in store. However, there is also a possibility that the author intended to convey even more. Maybe he's speaking literally here. If he is, then our interpretation could be that when the Jews are converted on a global scale, when there is that national ethnic conversion, then the resurrection of the dead, life after death, will commence. Meaning, and there are a lot of people who believe this, that when the Jews repent, Christ's kingdom is about to be consummated. Again, that makes sense if you correlate 144,000 Jews, Jewish converts in Revelation. And if this text refers to a national revival of the Jews and therefore the beginning of the end of time, what a glorious day that will be. Verse 16 makes this statement. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. If the root is holy, so are the branches. A very simple language. It could read, if the early portion of the Jewish believers is holy, then so is the latter. If the first fruits of the Jews, like those first generation believers combined with the Gentiles comprising the early church, if that was holy, then the second portion of the believing Jews who would then repent and be restored at a future date is also holy. Now taken together, this passage is stating that the future restoration of the Jews will surely come. It will surely be a spiritual blessing to all nations and could very well usher in a new age. In case this truth becomes cause for boasting among the Gentiles. (laughs) 
The author includes the much less controversial verses 17 to 24. He reminds us that we've taken the place of Jewish branches which have been broken off. Because this is true, we should remain humble, understanding that we ourselves can also be broken off just as easily, replaced by the original natural branches. Verse 17 says, if some of the branches were broken off and you, the Gentiles, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others, now share in the nourishing root of the tree, do not become arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is you. It is not you who support the root. The root supports you. There is, he says, only one tree of salvation. There is only one people with God, one people of God. The root refers to that original covenant people of God dating back all the way to the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. That ancient theocracy of the Old Testament was merged into the kingdom of Christ at his advent. Its name and nature may have changed, but there remains one family of God through the ages. We are still the same spiritual tree that the Lord planted thousands of years and even millennia ago. We are the same spiritual family as the millions of saints from bygone eras. And he says in verse 19, if you say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in, right? Like this braggadocious claim, you become arrogant, thinking, oh, I must be pretty great because he broke them off to include me. He says, do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. He's talking there about faith. If you do not have faith, yes, you will be cut off. But if you do have faith, he is kind. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, those who have been broken off because of a lack of faith, even they, if they repent and believe, they'll be grafted back in. God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, you were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree. How much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? We see there is only one tree of salvation. And the author ends where he began, a declaration that what really matters is faith in the Lord. People need the Lord. A promise of restoration for those Jews who will repent from their sin and exercise faith in Jesus Christ. In early 1943, Luz Long wrote the final letter he would ever send to his friend Jesse. Long, Long was in the German army in 1943. He was stationed in northern Africa. In that last letter to Jesse Owens, he said this. He said, there is nothing here but dry sand and wet blood. I have a feeling this will be my last letter, and indeed it was. He said, I'm not concerned for myself. I'm concerned for my wife and my young son, Carl. He is at home. He has never known his father. I would ask you, Jesse, that when this war is over, you would return to Germany, find my son, tell him about me. Tell him what the world was like before we were separated by war. I need to tell you that that first hour I met you in Berlin, I saw you were kneeling in prayer. I didn't know it at the time, but I understand now that our meeting was not by chance. Because today, I believe in God like you do. Your brother, Luce. Luce died in a field hospital after being wounded in the Battle of Sicily, July 9th, 1943. Eight years later, 1951, Jesse honored Luz Long's request. He returned to Germany. He searched out Luz's son, Carl. Sorry, I'm a little backed up here. He told him about his father. He told him about the world before the war. He told him about his father's faith. And Jesse Owens understood and knew this truth, that more than anything else, people need the Lord. And whatever your greatest fear may be, replace it with this one. That we would devote ourselves to something which may not matter for eternity. That we may get locked up in things which bind but do not count. That we may tangle horns over things which separate rather than unify. Verse 
that we may devote our energy and resources, indeed our very minutes, hours, months, years, lives, to things which distract from that one eternal truth, that it is faith in Christ which matters. And Lord, thank you for this message, which is so clear. And Lord, would you be honored by the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen.